Jen, thank you so much for welcoming me back to the Vancouver Board of Trade. I want to thank today's sponsors, the Sauter School of Business and Odgers Berenson, and the Vancouver Board of Trade Women's Leadership Circle, where I've had some interaction over the years, and I'm just delighted in the work that you're doing. I want to take the opportunity to tell you what a genuine pleasure it has been for me now over seven and more years to be welcomed by you. Right from the start when I arrived in Vancouver, it felt like a community uh, that was very encouraging, very inspiring, and very welcoming. Writer Lillian Gershwin said, people change all the time and they forget to tell one another. People change all the time and they forget to tell one another. We do, don't we? I've always thought that the time that I spend here with you is my chance to tell you how UBC has changed since we last spoke, to reintroduce you and UBC to one another, to offer, I hope, a spark of an idea or a story or an image that might cause you to think of the University of British Columbia with new eyes. I feel the need to do that today more keenly than ever before. And beyond that, I want to try to expand and strengthen the pathways that connect what you do with what we do, with what our city, our province, and our world need. So ladies and gentlemen, and thanks to the mayor for his presence, let me reintroduce the University of British Columbia, an innovation powerhouse with the highest income from licensed IP of all universities in Canada, the highest number of patents supplied for per year, the highest number of US patents issued per year, second highest number of licenses executed of discoveries and innovations and of startups per year, over 150 spin-off companies so far, and a partner to over 1,000 industry-sponsored research projects. In fact, we conduct $500 million worth of research every year, which accounts for 25% of all the research in British Columbia, and fully 94% of industry-sponsored research. We contribute now $12.7 billion annually to the provincial economy. We've committed $150 million through our Board of Governors to sustainability, sustainability infrastructure projects, more than any other university in the world, and have turned our Vancouver campus into a living laboratory where buildings, energy systems, and classrooms are also experiments in sustainability. The results of those experiments, once transferred to Vancouver and communities beyond our gates, hold the potential to influence the course of climate change. We're BC's third largest employer, as Janet said, the second largest public employer. We graduated over 11,000 students last year and just enrolled over 8,000 new ones from over 150 different countries. Our 285,000 alumni form a worldwide network that has helped us to raise $1.2 billion so far towards student aid and academic initiatives in our record-breaking Start an Evolution campaign. Not too shabby for a medieval institution. <laughs> and that's what we are. Our roots lie in the 14th century university model, a model grounded in service to the world through the conservation and creation of knowledge. But aside from the Latin motto above our very traditional looking crest, you would be hard pressed to find evidence of the roots of the university on a trip out to our campus today. Like most every other institution around the globe, UBC has undergone a radical transformation even over the past quarter century, and ours has been both physical and operational. The drivers of that transformation include globalism and global competition, technological change, and an economic upheaval 
as well as unprecedented student mobility, a radically altered work world, a shifting funding landscape, and the speed and necessity of constant innovation. Now, we've made our share of mistakes, and we've sometimes struggled with how to maneuver an un occasionally unwieldy institution through the hairpin turns of the last few decades. Like all of our counterparts, we've grappled with how to hold on to our core mission while maintaining a competitive edge in the new global education marketplace. After all, mission statements don't mean very much if you have to close your doors. But here we are, 136 years after Superintendent of Education John Jessup made his initial proposal for a provincial university, consistently ranked among the top 30 universities in the world, the top three in Canada, mission intact. And we're just getting warmed up. I'm going to step outside the university gates for a moment now to hold up a snapshot of BC's innovation ecosystem as a whole. The tech sector has transformed our economy. KPMG's 2012 British Columbia Technology Report Card actually calls it a cornerstone, the tech industry. And you can't argue with the numbers. The tech sector employs 84,000 people, more than forestry, mining, oil and gas combined. It's the third largest contributor to the provincial GDP, up from the number six just a decade ago. It produced $18 billion in revenue last year with a growth rate double that of BC's overall growth rate. It accounts for 10% of BC's exports already, $4.1 billion, double what it was in 2001. And it's been the second fastest private sector job creator over the entire decade. It provides $5.3 billion in wages with employees earning 50% more than the BC average. Incredible stats, but here's the sucker punch. BC ranks ninth among the provinces in productivity gains since 1985. As well, BC's tech sector is proportionately smaller in terms of share of GDP, investment, and employment than Canada's as a whole. 5.9% here versus 7.5% for the country. BC Business Magazine released its annual Top 100 list this July, ranking BC businesses by sector and revenues. Unfortunately, they poured a bucket of cold water on some prevailing enthusiasm about our economy, noting that BC's top 25 companies saw revenue drops last year, particularly, unfortunately, in the resource and energy sectors. Our top 10 financial service companies brought in 25% less revenue than the year before, and in mining, the golden child, we saw a drop of 5%. Now, BC Business Magazine cites our commodity-intense economy as a reason. With the Asian market, our largest trading partner as of last year, we're far more exposed than the rest of Canada to fluctuations in these economies. That's just a reality of our economy. Assuming wise stewardship, Natural resources will always be foundational to the British Columbia economy. Let's be clear about that. But it's time to take some pressure off. Diversify our portfolio. It's time we invested more deliberately in the greatest resource that we have here in BC, our innovative minds. Just for fun. What would it look like if we simply closed the gap between 5.9 and 7.5%, the difference between BC's tech sector share of the economy and that of the tech sector for Canada as a whole? Well, for starters, a $5.1 billion increase in industry revenue, a $2.5 billion increase in GDP, 
an additional 23,000 jobs and a 1.4 billion increase in wages paid. Again, fantastic numbers. But how's this for a surprise? The BC Industry Technology, Technology Industry Association, excuse me, tells us that that would actually be setting the bar too low. That's letting the growth continue at its traditional rate for almost another decade, whereas the opportunity right in front of us is actually much bigger. BC stands to command a significant share of a growing technology in the widest sense market. But we must take deliberate action now. So who's we and what's the action that we need to take? Well, an interesting report from the C.D. Howe Institute in June of this year names four key stakeholders in the future of innovation in the economy. Government, the granting agencies, you probably don't think much about them, the business community, and the research universities. Given that the majority of British Columbia's research and development takes place in the private sector, as is true worldwide, just how key a player is UBC or the other large research intensive universities of British Columbia? Well, that comes down to where we innovate. Universities were the first to develop much of the medical, engineering, and computer technology in use today. You know that. As well, many scientific discoveries that came from basic, as opposed to applied, research find their way into new technologies, such as breakthroughs in biology that lead to new methods of genetic engineering, or advances in solid state physics that make it possible to design faster processors for computers. Teaching hospitals connected to the university are sources of the most sophisticated new procedures. And university research was the source of almost all of the building blocks of our information age, from the architecture of digital computing to the development of underlying protocols for the internet. Many of the firms that pioneered modern information technology were, of course, spin-offs from university research projects, and they are responsible for much of the productivity growth that North America has experienced in the last quarter century, but where we have not done as well. So if we can agree that research universities are a key player in BC's innovation ecosystem, and if UBC really is the research powerhouse that I described earlier, then why aren't BC tech sector numbers better? The C.D. Howe report shows that right now, each of the four stakeholders, and Morali was right, this is a team pursuit, each of the four stakeholders is actually weakening or limiting the pathways by which technology transfer takes place. Technology transfer is the process by which university research contributes to technological progress and economic growth. Broadly speaking, technology transfer requires university expertise to provide the research and industry expertise to do the development. But universities and industry aren't the only players in the game. They're also policymakers and funders. And Canada continues to rely on universities to do the development activities that we are not designed or best placed to do. By maintaining that status quo, I think that we risk compromising the quality of Canadian universities, the effectiveness of our tech transfer process, and ultimately, our collective economic future. It's going to take the four stakeholders playing as a committed team to produce the kind of results that we're seeing in thriving tech hubs like San Diego's Connect or London's Tech City. The C.D. Howe report makes key recommendations designed to up Canada's game. First, and you know this because you've heard it again and again, I'm sure, Canadian business needs to spend more on research and development in order to play their role more effectively in the technology transfer process. 
we are underperforming, especially in relation to our American brethren. Granting agencies need to insist that all journal articles resulting from the research that they fund be made freely accessible to the public. I'll come back to that in a moment. Granting agencies also need to reallocate public funding to give more weight to overall academic excellence rather than immediate practical payoff. Now, this may seem completely counterintuitive, but the evidence shows that the greatest benefit to society and the economy comes from scientists for whom practical utility and individual financial reward are minor considerations. Canada's granting agencies have been shifting funds away from curiosity-driven research and toward commercialization. They've been told to do that by government. And yet, the C.D. Howe report tells us that the most effective technology transfer comes out of academic environments that are attractive to scientists and researchers who are driven primarily by the urge to advance knowledge in their field. And finally, looking inward a bit, University tech transfer offices need to focus more on fostering continuing general interaction between business and faculty and less on generating licensing income. This goes back to recommendation number three about making journal articles accessible to the public. In a really interesting Carnegie Mellon survey on industrial R&D, Businesses were asked to name the most effective channel through which they benefited from academic research. In most industries, the leading answers were publications, informal exchanges, and communication with scientists through consulting. Patents and licenses were hardly mentioned at all. So, I think we've all got our work cut out for us. Let me share with you a little bit about the progress we've made at UBC recently. The three pathways by which we've traditionally transferred knowledge, of course, remain intact. Publications, faculty experts acting as consultants, and graduate students as living knowledge transfers working in the field. However, we're recognizing that we have to go beyond these three. So at UBC, we've developed an innovation strategy designed to maximize the societal and economic benefits that arise from the transfer of innovation coming out of UBC, both social and technical innovation. It's made up of five components. First, we're opening a corporate relations office to better nurture and build relationships with industry. Through it, we'll be able to reach out actively to individual business leaders and organizations, associations, and think tanks. The office is also going to act as a concierge service for the business community in its interactions with UBC. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from leaders in the business and indeed in the social sectors where people say, I don't know where to go to connect with UBC. Well, we have heard you asking for that, and we're responding. I'm also going to invite your input on the specific services that you're looking for so we can be sure to try to meet your needs. Second, faculty consulting is simple. It's effective as an avenue by which business and other organizations can benefit from university expertise and help build connections. But historically, faculty experts have been left to manage consulting contracts themselves. Now we're looking at ways to take the administrative burden off of them so that they can focus on what they really do best, providing solutions to you. We've been watching what other universities are doing in Australia, in Europe, and the US, and we're opening uh, in 2014 a new uh, agency to facilitate access to faculty consulting. Third, I spoke earlier about UBC as a living laboratory. The sustainability systems and models that we help to develop from smart energy grids to, to zero emission buildings will be directly exportable and scalable to the wider community, working with industry partners and also 
with government and other civic leaders into the national and international spheres. And the unique approach that we've taken of addressing operational requirements by pairing industry innovation with our research expertise is also applicable to a wide range of activities beyond sustainability. Fourth, a key focus of our activities is, of course, entrepreneurship. And we've entirely redesigned entrepreneurship at UBC, our flagship program. It's now a full continuum consisting of education, workshops, venture creation, and seed funding. Alumni have been contributing time, expertise, and resources as mentors and executives in residence. The methodologies taught at the Sauter School match those applied in the venture creation workshops. And all content is going to be made available online, which ensures, I hope, broad-based access and scalability. In our pilot earlier this year, of the 14 teams that undertook an eight-week process, seven are now launching real-world companies. To cap our entrepreneurship at UBC component, Sauter is now offering a university-wide Entrepreneurship 101 class, which launched just last week. The course is already oversubscribed and contains students from 14 faculties and schools across the university. Fifth and finally, of all these activities, we have to find support, and that will be through the University Industry Liaison Office. Our UILO is one of the most successful tech transfer offices in Canada, but that said, it was designed in a different era, primarily for the commercialization of medical discovery. So we've begun the process of re-engineering it to serve all elements of our innovation strategy, to increase our ability to mobilize knowledge, to accelerate and streamline licensing processes for all types of discovery, and to steward sponsored research contracts effectively for everyone. Now, okay, I'm sure that I'm sounding like a proud parent, and I'm sorry about that, which is why I'm going to turn things over for a moment to some other people and to let you hear what they're saying about what's happening with UBC. Nitin Kawale, president of Cisco Canada, formed a partnership with UBC this spring that will undertake a number of energy-focused initiatives over the next five years. Kawali says, and I quote, the work done on campus will enable vital energy-saving solutions for the university and will also serve as a roadmap for future smart energy and smart community initiatives, not only in Canada, but around the world. Fortis BC pledged $300,000 over the next three years to our Master of Engineering in Clean Energy to support student co-op placement in industry. Doug Stout, Vice President of Energy Solutions and External Relations for Fortis says, and I quote, we've heard the call from universities to industry to provide opportunities for skilled workers, and we're looking forward to seeing these students apply their training to achieve sustainable energy solutions. Dr. Larry Goldenberg, founding director of the Vancouver Prostate Center at VGH says, Quotes, the holy grail of cancer research is the ability to not only detect cancer at its earliest stages, but to be able to predict its natural behavior in a particular individual. Goldenberg is partnering with electrical and computer engineering researchers and the BC Cancer Agency to develop a system of vibroelastography that detects stiffness in body tissues that may indicate the presence of a tumor. So far, it's been tested for use with liver, prostate, and breast cancers. I could go on. What would it look like? BC's innovation ecosystem, I mean, if we all chose to adapt and adopt the CD Howe report recommendations and committed ourselves to a thriving tech sector. The thing is, we're so close here. All the pieces are in place. It's the commitment and the working together that we need now, the shared vision and a common goal. I want to leave you with a last set of pictures. Now, in order to see these pictures, I'm going to need you to put on a special pair of glasses. Nope, not Google Glass. 
Those won't be available till 2014, and besides, they're $1,500 a pop. No, these goggles are by Recon Instruments, a small 2008 startup founded by four UBC solder and engineering grads. They sold their first pair in 2010, and they've moved more than 40,000 units of their Recon skis and Recon jets for cyclists since then at only $599 a pair. But the ones you're gonna put on are a gift. And don't worry, you're not gonna look silly because they're made for athletes. Therefore, they'll baseline your heart rate and your elevation. So let's head outside, out those doors. I wanna take you to the UBC campus. Road bike, mountain bike, your choice. Your recon jets are tracking your heart rate, cadence, speed, and distance. Hands-free, you sync them with your smartphone, call your business partner back at the office to gloat, upload photos and videos of the Burrard Bridge, West 4th Avenue, Jericho Beach as you speed by. After using buddy tracking to check in with the rest of your group, you use the nav system to set the last leg of your route, call up your favorite playlist, and you ride. You cross Blanca, and you speed down Chancellor Boulevard, Pacific Ocean on your right, ancient spruce and cedar and fir trees all around you, and you notice that something feels different here. You pull over and you ask a jogger on the trail beside you where you are, and she says, welcome to the living laboratory. You continue your tour and you notice that this living lab is ringed by residences that are occupied sustainably by students, faculty, staff from all over the world. You spot the bike racks everywhere, it seems, and the electric plant op vehicles, and the building that creates more energy than it uses, all part of the living laboratory. You spot steam emerging from a grate in the ground, and you stop a studious-looking fellow to inquire, and he says, we heat the whole campus with steam, but we're switching to hot water heating right now. More efficient, less waste, it's part of our smart grid project. You step into the green building, you slide into a rear seat in a darkened lecture hall, and you find yourself in a class the likes of which you have never experienced before. Civil engineering professor Don Mavnik is altering the phosphorus balance of wastewater to produce pellets that can be used as fertilizer in soils. Forestry professor Stavros Avramidis is using radio technology, the same thing that powers your AM, FM radio and your recons to decontaminate wood. UBC Fisheries Center's Amanda Vincent and her team are collaborating with the world's top photographers to focus the public's attention on the ocean's fragile coral reefs. Two students dressed in business suits and dress shoes, clearly from solder, walk towards you, alternating, texting, checking out you out on your recons. You preen a little, flattered, until ping, ha, huh, you realize that they've actually hacked your email and sent you this message. <laughs> a team of senior solder and engineering students has just claimed victory at the National Pacific Venture Capital Competition, the message reads, for Ven Air, a ventilated door. The door allows air to continually flow between rooms while remaining closed and blocking sound. Second place was awarded to another UBC team for Sound IT, a mobile application that lets customers select their own songs at their favorite bars. You quickly search for Sound IT and download it to your recons before reading the last part of the message. Three Sauter MBA students have established the Surrey Rent Bank, an organization that provides microloans to people facing eviction. At the latest count, the bank has provided uh, 26 loans and kept individuals and families in their homes. You're back on your bike now, navigating your way to University Boulevard, where a man in a white lab coat runs into the street, waves you down, not usually a good sign. I'm late, he says, and hops on the back of your bike without further explanation. Vancouver General, pronto. You're at the hospital within 15 or so minutes, but instead of waving goodbye, he invites you in. He shows you how CT film images, often in the thousands for a single individual, 
are being converted from film to digital, allowing practitioners to sort them and navigate to a specific site on a patient's body with the click of a mouse. How automated ultrasound imaging of liver, prostate, breast tissue takes less than a minute now instead of half an hour. How it can be done by technicians instead of physicians. How it's providing a clearer basis for cancer patient outcome analysis. It's how now this has become the standard of care for the BC Cancer Agency, the Vancouver Cancer Centre and throughout BC. Total accuracy. Broadway to Burrard over the bridge, you lock up your bike, head back to your head table here at the Hyatt Regency Ballroom, and you're just about to switch off your recons when you hear this announcement. UBC scientists have created a computer processor that's just as easy to program as current processors, but runs 10 to 1,000 times faster. You slide back into your seat, dazed, wondering if your new recons are already obsolete. <laughs> Welcome back. I called my presentation today the future of innovation. But what I just described is the present of innovation at UBC. It's already here. The future will be created out of what we collectively decide after lunch. At UBC, we want to be an active participant in an innovation ecosystem that's fast, fluid, streamlined, and efficient, every part operating according to its strength and purpose, and the results for our economy and for our society as a whole will be so much greater than the sum of those parts. This is a model of the kind of collaboration that can take place. The pharmacy building and the center for research and development in the drug industry. But there are hundreds and thousands of other similar opportunities. I'm inviting you now to work with me and my team to fulfill the promise of our innovation strategy, linking with your strategies for growth and success bringing to market new ideas, bringing to our society new ideas, better ways of doing things. Because right now, let's be frank, UBC and the other research intensive universities of British Columbia are actually innovating faster than BC's tech transfer process can keep up with. But together, we can change that. And I think we must. Thank you very much.